Now we move to our first panel discussion of the afternoon, and can I please invite uh, our first panellists to join us on the stage, led by the Chair, Peter Sheridan, along with him, the Reverend Harold Good, Brona Hines, Dennis Bradley, Judith Gillespie, and Danny Morrison. Please join us on stage. <clears throat> now, while they're taking their seats, let me tell you something about the panellists um, today. Peter Sheridan is an honorary professor in the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice, and has been CEO of the peacebuilding charity Cooperation Ireland since 2008. It is, of course, an all-Ireland organisation which enabled the first state visit of Queen Elizabeth to the Republic of Ireland and the reciprocal visit of the President of Ireland to the United Kingdom. Reverend Harold Good served as a minister in the Shankill in Belfast and at the Crumlin Road Prison. In 2001, he was appointed president of the Methodist Church in Ireland. In 2005, he was one of two independent witnesses, the other being Father Alec Reid, who oversaw the decommissioning of arms. And in 2007, he was awarded the World Methodist Peace Prize. Brona Hines was active in the Northern Ireland women's rights movement in the 1970s, the founder and chair of the Northern Ireland women's European platform, and along with other women, formed the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition. She served as the party's chief strategist for a period during which the party was involved in talks which led to the Good Friday Agreement, and two members were elected to the 1998 Northern Ireland uh, elections in the Assembly. Uh, she was the Deputy Chief Commissioner of the Equality Commission between 1999 and 2003. Danny Morrison is a writer who lives in West Belfast. In the 1980s, he was the National Director of Publicity for Sinn Féin. He served time as a Republican prisoner. And as well as writing and reviewing, he's also a political commentator in newspapers, television and radio. He's Secretary of the Bobby Sands Trust and a former chairperson of Fela and Fobble, the festival founded in West Belfast. Dennis Bradley, a former Vice Chairman of the Northern Ireland Policing Board, formerly a member of the Northern Ireland Drugs Committee and the BBC Broadcasting Council. He also helped set up the Bogside Community Association. Um, he is, uh, was co-chairman, along with Robin Eames, of the Consultative Group on the Past in Northern Ireland. And Judith Gillespie, CBE, is a retired senior police officer. She was the Deputy Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland between June 2009 and March 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, our first panel. Uh, good afternoon and um, thank you, Yvette. So just on behalf of the panel, could I welcome you all here this afternoon, particularly visitors, international visitors are, who are here with us. Uh, Professor Donnan, in, in his opening remarks, said that the conference was about two things. Was, one was looking back on the success of the agreement and the second was reflecting on what remains to be done. And it's that part that the panel are going to concentrate their focus on this afternoon. Uh, during the conflict, the law was not the only power with a degree of popular support. And indeed, if you look down the panel, a uh, former colleague of mine, uh, Judith Gillespie, was an RUC officer and, and laterally Deputy Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland. And beside me, Danny Morrison, who was charged twice with IRA membership. Those of you who are familiar with the agreement reached in the multi-party negotiations will have noted that fundamental to the multi-party talks was commitment to the principles of democracy, non-violence and exclusively peaceful and democratic means uh, of resolving differences. It also reaffirmed opposition to any use or threat of force by others. But yet, 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement, when prisoners were released, changes were made in policing, there are communities who remain under the influence and coercive control of paramilitary organisations. Recent media reporting suggests a 60% rise in so-called punishment attacks or violence against other people. In July 2016, building on the agreement, the Executive Action Plan under the Fresh Start Agreement on tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime, identified a key action to support initiatives aimed at building capacity in communities in transition, 
including through developing partnerships across civil society and across community divisions. It is the rule of law that protects basic rights and provides an environment for social, political and economic development as well as conflict resolution. But the rule of law without a culture of lawfulness is not really feasible. And without a culture of lawfulness, the community will have no desire to access the justice system and grievances are resolved by other means. In talking about a culture of lawfulness, I do not simply mean law enforcement, but rather a system that enhances an individual's quality of life and that of society as a whole. It is about considering ways to increase communities' control over their own lives. So some of the questions I want the panel to consider this afternoon are, what does transition to a culture of lawfulness look like? How do we reach a place where instead of that paramilitary influence, the mainstream thought or ethos in the community is sympathetic to the rule of law? Why have we not got there 20 years after the agreement? And accepting that law enforcement activity on its own is not sufficient, how do we generate a broader shift in culture and attitudes needed to support transition to a society in which 20 years after the agreement, paramilitarism has no place? How do we rebrand this place that the language of paramilitarism is no longer part of the everyday discourse? So I'm going to open up the, the panel, uh, the first question to um, Brona Hines. And those of you who watched the video will saw Brona was part of the multi-party uh, multi negotiations. And I guess, Brona, my first question to you is that 20 years on, did you think at that time that paramilitary organisations would still have that coercive control and influence in communities? And, and, and second part of that question is, why is it still there? Well, first of all, I think we need to, to um, respect that we have got so far in 20 years and that the peace agreement has, has survived uh, for 20 years because it doesn't happen in all cases. Uh, in a sense, it's less surprising to me to hear it being talked about today, for example, in the context of the statement issued yesterday by the Combined Loyalist Command, because in a piece of work that was done by the Community Foundation for Northern Ireland, engaging over a thousand women across Northern Ireland and in the uh, border counties, women were already raising these issues about the coercive control within communities and about the silencing of women and the lack of attention to crimes that ordinary people face in communities and the fear of uh, living within. Actually, what they were saying is, one of, and we see this in conflicts, um, that once when attention was, was faced outward to another community, looking at where the danger was coming, it was now faced, that control was faced within communities. I think one thing that we can look back on with pride, actually, one of the great successes of the agreement was uh, the reform of policing. And I want to point that out because in the early days when it was difficult to get the reform of policing up and, and going, civil society played a major role in the early district policing partnerships and women formed 50% of those policing partnerships. And what we're hearing now is a lack of investment within communities, within that cross-community work and particularly insufficient attention going to women and to resourcing women and ensuring that they are part of the leadership and decision making across all communities. Danny, you, you have a unique perspective on this given your background in it. Um, and By the way, I wasn't convicted. On any you weren't I should have said that. <laughs> what, surprised, <laughs> what surprised me is you were charged twice, so you must have left it in between times or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, I want to preface my remarks in response to the question by saying that when the IRA ceasefire, I was in prison, uh, served an eight-year sentence. I remember going back to my cell and crying for all of the people who had lost their lives, all of the suffering. And I was convinced at that moment, even though it was later to break down, I was convinced at that moment that that was a, that was a major psychological turning point and that, that from there on we were going to have to reach a political settlement. I also 
had a rough idea of the political parameters of the uh, settlement that would come about on Good Friday Agreement, but there were other, of course, major problems. I didn't know how I was going to be able to support policing because of my own personal history and the history of my community with the RUC going back from the time of partition. And so I, I think that the, the uh, Patent Commission and the, the transformation into the PSNI was extremely important for people like myself and for my community to, um, uh, to allow us to move towards an allegiance, to encourage young people to uh, support policing at that time. I also realised that it was the Sinn Féin uh, and, and, the, and the SDLP were gambling because it hadn't been decided yet what, was, what the foreign policing was going to take after Good Friday. That had to go into commission. But similarly, it was also very difficult for David Trimble and the Ulster Unionist Party to take the gamble that IRA decommissioning down the road would happen. I was opposed to decommissioning because of what had happened in August 1969. Always remember that slogan painted on the wall. Out of the ashes of Bombay Street arose the provisionals. And so there was a linkage in my mind with the protection of my community and with arms. And that took some time uh, to come about, for decommissioning to come about. So we are in a, a transformed situation. I think we are in an exceptional situation if you look at other conflict societies, if you look at the poor Palestinians, if you look at other states around the world, we have come a thousand miles mm -hmm. and we are in a new, new situation. But I think that the magnitude of the problem with regards to policing is different in different communities. I, 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 I would be critical of uh, Lloyd's paramilitaries because I think they handed over whatever power uh, whatever political support they could have generated as a result of the work in the communities, they handed that hook, line and sinker over to the mainstream unionist parties to the extent that uh, they, they've lost their, they, they can't get a mandate anywhere most of the elections have taken place. Whereas on the Republican side, uh, Sinn Féin from, since, since 2001 has become the party of choice of the nationalist community, probably because it was seen to be much more muscular than the, the SDLP in negotiations for a variety of reasons. But I think that we have come forward uh, big time. I, I think that there is a problem in terms of I find it sometimes very difficult to support the PSNI because the policing has to be impartial. And you can't have a situation where there is a bonfire, there is an effigy of Martin McGuinness in his coffin, where our people, the people flag is flying from it, and you don't go in because there's a thousand people around that bonfire. But because if there's a hundred people in Lurgan, on Easter Sunday marching in a distant period, you can go in there and demonstrate. That is very dangerous. It places people like me in an awkward position. And I imagine also it places young nationalists who have decided to join the PSNI in an awkward position. So there are, there are ongoing problems. But the biggest problem, and I, I don't want to dis disrupt the, the, the good mood here, but I do not trust the British government. And over this issue of Brexit, <laughs> if the British government, if their interests are greater than ours, their interests come first. And so the danger is, outside of loyalists or outside of Republican areas, that ordinary people who would be affected by Brexit along the border areas in the event of a hard Brexit, the police are going to be put in to police protests. You can, you can, write, you can write the script. Uh, a police car is overturned. Somebody's hit over the head and dies of a heart attack. That makes it much more easier for Republican dissidents to have a culture where people will turn a blind eye to that. And that is very dangerous, and that we have to avoid, because that would take us back to 1994. Dennis, um, from the community perspective then, so, so those are some of the continuing problems, and, but what needs to happen or change that those, particularly those communities that are under that control, what <coughs> needs to change in those communities that, that frees up people in those communities, that we're not in 20 years' time still talking about paramilitary organisations and paramilitary activity? Well, there's a slight danger that we talk as if this was a homogeneous situation when it's not. You have to, I think, analyse and define the differences. On the Republican nationalist side, there is a dissonance. And the dissonance are decreasing in influence and in presence and in relevance. They're a little bit like kind of teddy boys at, at a rave party. They're kind of out of fashion. Um, I mean that in the sense that they look for, for kind of relevance by actually going for the place where they can get, they feel they've got some support from the community, which is the drugs issue. 
So they take people out whom they accuse of actually using or abusing drugs and they shoot them in the legs or they shoot them. So that's the, but they're anti the agreement, so they're anti where, where the, in some ways the community is and they're outside of that. The loyalist situation, which I know less of, but I have had some contact with and some insight to, is a whole different ballgame. UVF and the UDA say they're kind of pro the agreement in general. And yet, they have people walking around their communities who are called brigadiers. And when I was on the policing board, I was kind of given the job of going out and beginning to get the feel of this stuff and negotiate with some, spent a good bit of time with David Irvin talking, and then later on began to talk to, to, to the UDA, while other people had already done a lot of the work, including yourself, Peter. But it was interesting in the sense that I think 14, 15 years ago, those people, the leaders of those two organizations were being told that they had a couple of years to actually get their house in order and to go away. And I was very disappointed yesterday that we had the kind of the leaders of, of, of the main Protestant churches not coming with a statement about the UDA and the UVF going away, but about kind of saying that we won't have uh, drug dealers or criminals around us anymore. Now, I don't think that's good enough. I think we should, our expectations need to be higher than that for those communities. Because the truth of the matter is, you cannot resolve, you cannot transform any community if it cannot breathe. And if you have violence hanging over a community, it cannot breathe in the fashion it needs to breathe to be healthy. If you go into Republican communities, there is no sign feeling of the presence of the provisional IRA. In Derry, for example, there's no presence of that. Now, I hear unionist politicians saying, oh, but the Army Council is still in existence. I don't know if they are or not. But the, problem, but the difference is there is no relevance, there is no presence of that, there is no fear. People are breathing, they're having their views. Dissidents have destroyed the type of community policing that we need within Republican areas in that the police can't walk the streets and have the community presence that they should have. That they have been the stone in the shoe of that. My, my criticism of policing at this moment of time would be that actually I think that they can walk the streets within loyalist communities because it is an abomination for loyalist, so-called loyalist uh, people to shoot police officers. So I think that there's a, there is not the same threat to policing. And I think years ago, the presence of the police should have been within those communities so that the people could gain the freedom to express themselves, to develop themselves. And I think that will not happen until those communities are beginning to... So you have, on one hand, the dissidents who are just a, an irritant, and on the other hand, within loyalist communities, I think that you have a major, major problem. I don't want to go on too much, but I did spend a day with the UDA and the UVF around the issue of drugs. And they told me very poignantly and showed me very poignantly the number of their people, both old and young, who were both drinking themselves to death and drugging themselves to death. As a result of that, and this I think we have to take some responsibility for, because I worked in drugs for years and years and years, it was kind of my background. I went to the lottery looking for money to actually do a scheme within that. The, mo the lottery were putting millions into areas that were actually been dealt with already by the public health authorities. But this one was too difficult, too messy. Later on, I went to the Department of Justice and I said, you need to do something about this drugs problem, particularly within those difficult areas. And I was told that it would be taken care of by the community partnerships. 10 years on, we're now in a major problem with drugs in all of our communities and with drink within all of our communities. And I do not see any ability within our institutions at this moment of time to begin to discuss that, have a, have a relationship with that, and actually do the hard work which I think is necessary, particularly within those loyalist communities. And, and just to, and, and, and. On your comment about, you know, in the bog side that you don't experience that, I, I had a group of TDs up from the Doyle recently in a 
part of Belfast, and we were having a, a, a loyalist part of Belfast, and they were talking to some of the people on the street and asking about paramilitary activity. And um, one of the individuals we were talking to said, well, you see the guy who was the taxi driver that brought you here, he's in the organization. The guy over in the, the, shop, the fruit shop across the way, he's in it. And he went on to name, and it was almost that normality of, of people who are in the organization. Um, Harold, yesterday, um, the three loyalist organizations made a statement um, about repudiating criminal activity and that and, and you heard some of Dennis's criticism that it's just another statement as when Jonathan Powell was involved the last time. Um, what is your sense of it? Because I think in, in Dennis's words there, there are there are communities at the minute that cannot breathe. And and the twenty years after the agreement, they still cannot breathe. Yeah, as uh, many of you we've talked some of us over lunch, and uh, I've been listening very carefully to the comments that have come to us since yesterday from uh, people across the community, in the media, and people you meet on the street, and people uh, we've talked to, and uh, there's a mixed bag of reactions and responses to what happened yesterday morning. Uh, and I think that's very understandable, given the history the history of this place and the history of loyalism and the history of republicanism, the um, uh, history of all of us. We're inclined to pick out loyalists and republicans, but we all have a history. And it's easy to, uh, be, uh, it's easy to be doubtful, and it's easy to be cynical. And I've heard uh, cynicism in the last 24 hours, uh, and I've heard questions and understandable questions and rightful questions and uh, concerns. Um, but it's not the first time I've heard all of that. In 2005, when my friend Father Alec Breed and I were involved in the decommissioning and in the post-decommissioning uh, period, uh, I heard all of the same all of the same. And I don't think there would be many reasonable people nowadays who would question uh, what took place at that time. And uh, so, you know, we're right to question, entitled to question, it's important to question, uh, but there comes a time when we have to take, you can forgive me for using it, a leap of faith. <laughs> and there needs to be something called trust. Um, this, it wasn't the first time that I had to, uh, to listen to all of this, uh, nor is it the only place I've had to listen to all of this. Uh, this past weekend, I have spent in the Basque country, uh, where I've been on many occasions. And where I was, incidentally, it's uh, interesting that uh, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary here of the Good Friday Agreement. This weekend, I was with the folks in the Basque country, and we were marking the first anniversary uh, of the decommissioning of the weapons of ETA. And again, I remember last year when we were involved in the decommissioning of the weapons of ETA, well, they're all the same kind of doubts and questions, and there was cynicism. But I will tell you that on Sunday morning, we unveiled a most remarkable monument. It was of a 30-foot axe, the head of which was buried in the ground, and at the top of the shaft of the axe was a tree blossoming with new life and foliage and hope, the bearing of the axe. And so, on one side, the cynicism, the questions, understandable and rightful and important, but on the other hand, there has to come a moment when we actually give credit. Yesterday, the two people I met yesterday, amongst all the other voices I heard in the library, Lynn Hall Library yesterday, there were two, I was going to say two wee women, because that's how we talk here, isn't it? <laughs> two wee women from the Shankill, and they came over to me 
And they said, Reverend, this is a great day for the Shankill. And I thought, amongst all the other things I was hearing, here are people who are saying, we're going to give this a chance. We, we need to give this a chance. And so there is no magic wand. There is no switch. If anybody can find this switch where you can just turn everything off and over, let me know where it is. Uh, we do need to encourage. Uh, but let me just finish by saying this. The problems we face in these communities, be it a loyalist community or a Republican community, we are not peculiar here in Northern Ireland. You travel the globe and you'll find in every urban situation parallel problems. And you know what? The common features and factors in these places are economic and employment disadvantage and educational <coughs> underachievement. Those two things, they go together with a culture of lawlessness. And we need to address those. If we want to release people from that culture of lawlessness, we need to address these <coughs> fundamental factors which are common in every urban community that I have ever visited, and I've visited many. Economic uh, disadvantage, uh, employment disadvantage, and educational underachievement. So in our questioning, which is right and proper, let us take <coughs> and share responsibility for the transformation of communities. That was the key word from the loyalists, not just yesterday, but I've heard it in all the journeys I've made with people. We want to transform our communities. And we don't just transform them by more lawful procedures. We have to get down to the heart of these issues. Thank you. So we have about five or six minutes left. So um, taking those two wee women from the Shankill who expressed a sense of hope yesterday, how do we make sure that hope isn't dashed? What are the practical activities that need to happen? Judith, you, given your experience, not just in policing, but Quality Commission, the Probation Board, Human Rights, and so on, what needs to happen that gives those two wee women in the Shankill hope? Well, first of all, it's a real privilege to take part in this event. Um, and I am very conscious that we are taking a, a moment's pause to look back over 20 years, and it's impossible to discuss all of the progress, all of the changes that have been made in that 20 year period. But I think the one thing that really strikes me most in terms of the transformation of policing, which we could talk for three hours alone about this afternoon, is the confidence figure in the PSNI, which I think over 90% of the people of Northern Ireland independently surveyed have confidence in policing here. I think any police service worldwide would be very, very uh, happy, not complacent, but happy with that figure. But that's not to say, of course, that things are perfect. They're far from it. And uh, a previous chief constable some years ago commented that policing was far too important to be left to the police. And I remember uh, being on a community policing visit to New York City in the late 1990s when they were uh, suffering from a, a serious uh, problem of gangland crime and murders. And one of the community representatives from New York City, a woman called Felice Kirby, said that the community are not just the eyes and ears of the police, but they are the muscle and brain as well. And I think as police officers, we need to lis listen to that very carefully. As a former police officer, we need to listen to what the communities are saying and not um, be uptight about letting go of decision-making and empowerment to communities. So I can recall in uh, 2003, 2004, when we were having discussions with community-based restorative justice schemes, how difficult it was to engage political support in letting go of some of the decision-making in the formal justice system to empower those schemes to deal with creative, innovative, solutions to local community problems. And I honestly think 
that building on those successes is definitely the way forward. So some of the work uh, being done under the Fresh Start Agreement by the Probation Board um, with prevention work, um, diverting young men in particular, but young women too, away from the formal criminal justice system into positive community-based activities, the introduction of problem-solving courts, for example, the issue that Dennis has been talking about in terms of drugs, um, again, trying to divert people with complex needs out of the criminal justice system, uh, empowerment of women, as Brona has touched on, uh, mothers, sisters, partners, daughters who have huge influence in the lives of those young men who are on the edge of criminality and on the edge of paramilitary activity, really building on that success and empowering women to exercise that influence positively in the longer term. But the big frustration, I guess, uh, and I'll not speak for George, he can speak for himself, George Hamilton, the Chief Constable, one, one of the big frustrations is the inability to plan longer term without long term budget planning. You know, you look at the transformation of policing, it was a 10 year plus program which was funded for 10 years. You know, we need to have programs that are funded based on the draft program for government, outcomes based uh, assessment, looking at longer term outcomes, not quick fixes. Uh, and finally, just to say, I think there are also tactical changes that can be made that can help communities become more connected with the formal criminal justice system. So, for example, when uh, assets are seized from paramilitary groups, from high-profile, well-known in the community paramilitary figures, that there's a connection between where that money goes and benefits to the local community that suffered from that paramilitary crime. So why don't we say, when we're setting up a community-based project or fund, funded by assets seized from Mr. or Ms. X? No, why not? So we can see the direct connection between the harm that was caused by those individuals and on the other side, the benefit that can be made to local communities and involve local communities in how that funding is spent through um, you know, participatory budgeting, through other democratic ways in which disenfranchised, disillusioned, disconnected people can actually influence local decision making. We have one minute left, so I want to give you 30 seconds because I want to finish as I started with Bruna, right. who was around that um, well, table at the start, and give her last 30 seconds. Well, I agree a lot with a lot of what's been said, but I would re emphasize that I do not think that a lot of the transformation that is necessary will take place if there's a gun in the background. I think people always know if there's a gun in the background. They are the, that's the most sensitive thing that they know. And therefore, you cannot create the type of policing, great and all, is, is the transformation we've achieved. I think within certain communities, it could be much better if they thought there wasn't a gun there. I think that social issues could be adapted, it could be uh, tackled if there wasn't a gun there. And I think, that, I think that whoever, the police, the governments, the institutions here, whatever we have at this moment of time, and the churches, and this is where I go back to yesterday, I think within the Republican nationalist community, there is a greater freedom at the moment. Dissidents are still there, but not as much as they were. And there is a freedom that people can breathe, talk, debate, and so forth. I'm not convinced that that's within some of the working class loyalist communities, because they're still fearful that there's a gun somewhere in the background. Dennis, I I've, think I've I'm going to cut you there, because I have a fear we're going to be strong armed off the stage. And the sight of Danny Morrison and myself and Judith Gillespie being strong armed off the stage is not <laughs> somewhere to go. Could I just leave, Bruna, 30 seconds. You were there around the table 20 years ago. We're still things we need to do. Uh, I'm still thinking of those two wee women in the shankle who need hope. You have 30 seconds yeah. before we... Well, I think, just to finish where we started with women, women are not just victims, they're agents for change. And I think what Judith... <laughs> 20, 20 years is a long time to wait for someone to come out with a statement on criminality. We welcome it. 
but we cannot have symbols that talk about prepared for peace and ready for war. Actually, we need to move faster in that transformation. Attention goes to those who make the most noise, whether it's politicians who make the most noise, or whether it's paramilitary groups or former paramilitary groups that make, make the most noise. And I'm with Judith. We need to look down into communities and invest back into communities and not forget about that, and particularly bring forward yet again the leadership women, role that women have in those communities and in political decision-making. Can I ask you to give my panel a warm round of applause?